Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's conference on reproductive justice, gender and diversity perspectives. I'm Emma Orson, and I'm the director of the Center for Diversity and Policy here at the University of Galway and uh, part of the project team for this project. And we're really delighted to welcome so many of you both in person and online today. I'm just going to run through a few quick housekeeping announcements, particularly for those who are in the room. Uh, in person, so we obviously have a, a map ring requirement for all of us at the conference. And if you don't have a map and you want one, it will be available at the registration desk. And if you don't feel well, you're able to definitely use that one of the staff members who are able to support. Uh, the fire exits are the door to the right of the lectern here, the door to the left as you leave on the ground floor, the two doors at the top of the auditorium. Um, if you don't use the lift, if there is a uh, fire. Fire alarm will lock, and our assembly point is T1, which is across from the front of the building near the new badge parking spot. If you need any assistance to exit the building um, in the event of an emergency, please let us know and uh, make sure you complete it um, an evacuation plan with a member of the team and other institutions. A few other small things the photography, we will be taking some photographs today. If you'd rather not be in a photograph, you can just let us know. Um, and please don't use the flash if you're tired of taking pictures. The most successful bathroom is on the top of our building. No uh, but there is a point to be on the ground floor if that's the bathroom. Okay, so I think that's all of my housekeeping. Um, obviously, the, uh, we are going to be live tweeting the event if you are still on Twitter. Um, so we're using the hashtag CDLT Justice. Um, and we have a uh, code for, for the Wi Fi for anyone in the building if you need any assistance that one wants to do with that. Uh, in a moment, those of you in the building and online will open our lovely holding slide for this event, which has actually can't really hear on um, And we also uh, we have the privilege to have a piece of art um, on the holding slide with the commission from the artist Mary Duffy, uh, a famous artist who created uh, the big image. And so I'm going to attempt to do a bit of a description of it. Um, okay, so my attempt uh, with Dr. Ford and my colleagues in developing a description of the artwork is uh, that the image is a photograph of different parts of the body shot on film that threw wounds and then the body is in position to go to the shot again. And um, it's actually the photos of the photos of the artist as a young woman. And it takes place, the process of rewinding and reshooting takes place a number of times until the end of the image that shows different body parts and other dimensional beings in very stark pictures. So the leg and arm and face and the flesh in between that both connect and are disconnected to give an impression and perspective on the body. So obviously the body is uh, a central the body and mind is a central part of what we're going to be talking about today when we talk about reproductive justice. So in opening today, I want to be clear again, as we've been trying to be at all of our events where we talk about this work on what we understand disability to be, what we understand reproductive justice to be for the purpose of the project. So we draw on Sister Song's understanding of reproductive justice. justice as the right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. In this project, over the last four years, we've been exploring disabled people's access to reproductive justice in Ireland. I can hear myself echoing on something here, so I might see if I can turn that off. Hopefully that worked. Um, so we've been thinking about disabled people's access to reproductive justice in Ireland and in keeping with a broad understanding of reproductive justice, we focused in particular on four key topics, so, which we will have panels on throughout today, fertility and contraception, abortion, pregnancy and birth and parenting. And our project has had three key ways that we've explored this access to reproductive justice. First, we've been collecting oral histories. We've been conducting interviews with key informants to contextualize our analysis of the law policy and practice. And also we've developed some toolkits for professionals. And today we're launching the findings of this research and looking for ways to move the work forward. We recognize that this is really only the beginning of a conversation about these topics. We also take a really broad approach to conceptualizing disability in this project. So we've been 
trying to make sure that in our work we span a, a wide range of experiences of body-mind differences, including but not limited to people with chronic illness, neurodivergent people, people with physical, sensory and intellectual disabilities, people with experience of mental health system and deaf people. We recognize the diversity of the disability community and we're particularly interested in hearing from disabled migrants, including people living in direct provision, disabled travelers and queer disabled people. So we set out to try to understand better disabled people's experiences of making reproductive decisions and how those decisions were or were not respected by others, including key professionals in the health, social care and legal systems. We're interested in exploring how the law scaffolds those decisions or disregards them. Who does the law view as the decision maker in these contexts and what kinds of factors, what kinds of privilege we might hold, the congruence with medical advice, so if we're agreeing with what doctors suggest, we're less likely to be questioned, we're more likely to have our decisions respected and when we resist, that is less uh, apparent. So we're looking at how those kinds of factors influenced whether someone's decision would be respected or not. And while we did find a lot of evidence of ableism in the health, social care and legal systems that govern reproductive decision making in Ireland, at times it was difficult to untangle that ableist assumptions from other types of prejudice, you know, within a legal system that privileges medical knowledge, for example, over individuals' understandings of their own body minds. We are really privileged to have held space for the stories that people told us in the last four years. Some of those stories have been captured in the oral histories that are now archived and freely available from the project, but other stories showed up in different ways. So sometimes we got those stories from key informants or participants in many of the discussion forums that we ran through during the project, the road shows and the workshops that we held. Sometimes we were surprised to hear professionals in particular say the quiet part out loud when they describe the routine ways in which people's bodily autonomy or parental rights could be undermined medically and legally. And we've not moved on as far as we might like to think from some of the experiences that, for example, participants and key informants recounted in our, in our oral histories and our key informant interviews. You know, one person told us early on in the project about covert contraception being administered to people in institutional settings described as the pill in the porridge. And we like to think that we've moved on and that doesn't happen now. But we must remember and acknowledge and we try to do this in our work that our courts continue to authorize forced interventions during pregnancy and after birth for pregnant disabled people, while disabled people also remain at higher risk of having their parental rights removed. We do recognize that many of the professionals who are willing to speak to us for this project represent those who are already open to a new way of doing things and learning from those who have the real expertise, which is, of course, disabled people themselves. We hope that the toolkits we're launching today will help others who are new to this topic and looking for guidance on how to respect disabled people's rights in practice. But it remains a damning indictment of the existing systems that we need these kinds of initiatives in the first place. And now we're here at the end of the four years of our project, but only the beginning of the journey to understand disabled people's experiences of reproductive decision making in Ireland and how these will continue to evolve really in a post repeal landscape, how they're going to be shaped by the advent of assisted human reproduction legislation and, of course, the implementation of the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act. Today is an opportunity for us to come together and honor these experiences that people have really generously shared with us in our project and recognize how much more work we need to do together. And I really think that it's those of us in this room in person and virtually that are quite a powerful community that can demand change and affect change in how disabled people's reproductive decisions are respected. So I invite you all to listen very carefully to our powerful speakers and let's agree that we're all going to leave here making a commitment to push for change in the spaces that we hold power in. And we all hold power in different spaces, whether it's in our friend groups, our workplaces, in activist and campaigning roles. So if you hear an action today or get an idea for something you can do, write it down, make yourself a voice note, make some kind of commitment to do something with it. And I'm going to remind you of this commitment later on, because we're not asking people here today to share their experiences, their hopes, their disappointments in how they've been treated and how others would be treated just for the sake of it. We have to honor those experiences by taking action. So I'm really inviting you to come on this journey with us today and think about the actions that we're all going to take.
So with that, I uh, have the pleasure to introduce uh, Freya Harold's daughter, who's going to be our keynote speaker for this morning. Um, Freya is an Icelandic disabled woman, feminist and activist with a long history and experience in both the feminist and disability movements. Um, she has incredible experience to share with us today and those of you who've uh, been to summer school many years ago, not that many years ago, <laughs> might remember Freya's powerful keynote when we tackled the topic of family. So I'm really proud and privileged to introduce Freya to you and to listen to her keynote today. Thanks Freya. Okay, that was great. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for having me at this super important conference about reproductive justice. The topic is very important to me, and this was out of doubt a principal aspect of disability justice work in Ireland and elsewhere. Today, I'm going to share with you my journey of becoming a disabled poster mom the road towards it and the path that I've taken afterwards. Before I start, I want to express gratitude to my 17-year-old foster son, Steve, for trusting me to be one of his mothers and for gladly consenting to the words, photos, and topic of this presentation. I will be using PowerPoint slides and the slides that I have up now has the title of the presentation, but now you have me, it says, Becoming a Disabled Foster Parent in Iceland. And then it has my name on it and a photo uh, from the courtroom at the Supreme Court of Iceland, where I am in a lying down wheelchair uh, with my three attorneys, two women and one man, and we're all white people and behind us at the, the courtroom. I ran into the courtroom almost too late from being stuck in traffic and forever finding an accessible parking space in downtown Reykjavik. One day, the Supreme Court of Iceland read my verdict. After seven years and three court hearings of trying to be assessed to become a foster parent, I won my case. Every step of the way had been long, rough, and in many ways unjust. I had been accepted by my local authorities, but then denied by the Agency of Child Protection in Iceland before I was assessed. The main reason was that I was assumed not to be in good health due to my disability, not being able to bond with children due to my physical impairment, and due to my need for personal assistance, I would be able, I would not be able to offer foster children stability. They would be confused by who was their foster mother or caregiver. It was also argued that foster children were damaged and had difficult behavior which I would not be able to handle. It probably does not have to be said in here, but the argument was in a way that it was important to keep the risky parents from the risky children. An absolute stigma shit show. I appealed this decision to an adjudication committee, can't say this word, of the Ministry of Welfare, and they agreed with the agency. I should not be let through the assessment process. I then decided to take my case to court and lost at the district court of Reykjavik. Although devastated, terrified, and exhausted, both by the process but also the online hate and ableist discourse about this court case, I decided after a few friends kind of kicked my ass that I would take the case to court of appeals in Iceland, which was at the time a pretty new court level, and I won. Um, I'm just going to stop and see with the slides. Uh, on the slide, I have a list of things that uh, was argued against me, like the health, bonding, stability, connection, and intimacy, and the risky parent, risky children. 
suspect, and then there's a photo from the courtroom of the Supreme Court of the judges. Uh, they are five, and to no one's surprise, four men and one woman, all white. The court decided, the Court of Appeals, that to deny me access to the assessment process for foster parents was disability discrimination. It also stated that it was contradictory to use my need for personal assistance, which is a legal right in Iceland, as an excuse for being an unfit parent, since the goal of personal assistance is to ensure full participation in society. To add, the verdict also stated that the case had not been investigated thoroughly enough with this agency's obligation. The verdict was and still is the most beautiful piece of paper I have ever read. And it gave me both hope and energy for the way forward. My hard work paid off. And on this slide, it says the Court of Appeals. And then I have a photo of uh, myself and two attorneys, the ones who uh, supervised the court hearing in the Court of Appeals. Uh, and this, yeah, the two women that were also, were also on the other photo, and we we're all white. Okay. A few weeks after the verdict, the Agency of Child Protection appealed the verdict to the Supreme. Court of Iceland. I'll be totally honest with you and say that those decisions almost got the better of me. I was so dumb. The emotional toll this takes is indescribable. But with the support of my family and friends, fellow activists, my unstoppable attorneys, we finished the race with success. The Supreme Court was locked as radical, if we can say that as a court of appeal, however, concluded that I had not received due process, the case had not been fully investigated, and that the Agency of Child Protection did not have the authority to deny me without offering me equal opportunities to be assessed to become a foster parent. And here is a slide that has the title of the Supreme Court, and there's a photo of my Self holding the verdict from the Supreme Court, of course, smiling happily. The three days after the Supreme Court verdict was issued, the Minister of Social Affairs and the Director of the Agency of Child Protection came on the news and stated that this verdict was a reason to worry about the rights of the child and that and could maybe lead to law reforms. I was sitting at home and felt like I had been punched in the gut when I listened. I turned off the TV. While I was overjoyed that I had won my case, proud and hopeful for the future, I slowly felt deep sadness, aloneness, and fear. Everyone was congratulating me and treating me like now the process was over, my job was done. However, the first response from the authorities was not to apologize to me or hold themselves accountable. They took the outcome as a threat to children and need and the need to change the law so they could better discriminate against disabled parents. Also, now it was time for me to have the assessment at the exact same agency as I had been fighting in court on all levels. My job was not at all done. The assessment process entails a three week workshop titled Foster Pride, where you're both educated about foster care and given an opportunity to work in groups with other prospective foster parents. Well, at least that's what they say. You also must answer over 20 pages of questions about very personal stuff, your ideology, religion, views, and so forth. The 
it's called a life book. Then you have interviews with the supervisors about the workbook. This process turned out to be super mentally straining for me uh, for various reasons. And after each weekend, submissions of the life book and the interviews, I was consumed. The first time I entered the workshop, we sat in a circle with two meters between us because COVID and introduced us and shared our aspirations. That's when I realized I was one of the very few persons at the workshop that wasn't, al wasn't already fostering. Almost everyone was fostering before needing to attend the foster care workshop that I had spent seven years getting the permission to attend. Besides me, there a couple who had applied for months earlier, applied to become foster parents for months earlier, and had already fostered siblings. Although I probably could have told myself this would be the case, the heaviness of discrimination, oppression, and deep ableism dawned on me. It's not a win, not enough to win a court case. You're still being oppressed by the oppressor. But I finished the workshop and I was licensed as a foster parent. The Agency of Child Protection tried to narrow my license by suggesting that I could only foster older children, but withdrew it after being confronted by my attorneys and myself, admitting they had no grounds to base their arguments. But then the call came. I was with my friend at a car dealership, which is a bit ironic since I don't have driving license, nor have I ever driven a car. But anyway, when my phone rang and there was a social worker on the other line telling me I had been suggested by the Agency of Child Protection for a 15-year-old boy who had just experienced a foster care disruption and needed a home. I didn't get to know much except that he came to Iceland as a refugee three year, years earlier. Although I will admit that I was scared, something inside me yelled at me that I should say yes. Three weeks later, he moved into my home. So there was a 35 year old woman who had lived alone for a long time, all of a sudden living with a teenage boy. It didn't take long for me to realize that the court case arguments were all far from reality. It took my son 48 hours to understand the concept of personal assistance. He was never confused about who to turn to, nor was he having difficulties connecting with me because of them. Today, he demonstrates his knowledge by being rude to me and polite to my assistants, for example. He also asks them to leave when he needs privacy with me. And when I asked him to push my wheelchair a few months ago because my assistant was hosting a lot of stuff, he made it very clear to me that yes, he could do that, but he did not plan on being my assistant. So that was that. Since he was a teenage boy, holding him was not a part of my motherly duties. Would be a bit inappropriate, although this was a deep very through the court case. And while my house is annoying, when it's not great, like for any other parent, but in general, I'm fine, just disabled. Okay, I have on the slide now, uh, photos of us, first photos of my son, the first day I met him. Um, uh, he is wearing a sports sweater, red top and is on his phone and he is a person of color. On the next photo is from this Christmas, where I'm opening the present from him. He's standing with me and helping me open the present. And the third uh, photo is of the two of us also uh, when we were traveling. And for those who can see the photo, I can see that he's not so overjoyed with me taking this, this third photo not the fan of the camera. Um, yeah, I will talk to my colleagues. Uh, being with son's mom is the most extraordinary experience 
I've ever lived through. And they shaped me and changed me in profound ways. My son's walk of life so far has been shaped by systemic oppression, racism, ableism, violence, all resulting in complex trauma. He has multiple diagnoses, none of which he had been informed of when he came home to me and needs a lot of support and services across different systems. A lot of things I, he needs I was not informed of and due to neglect in a former foster home and in the foster care system, there was a lot to learn about him. What has been the most difficult for me as a disabled mother who's gone through the traumatic process of going to court was to go from being the most unfit, risky and even dangerous prospective mother in the country to being the mother of a child who was described as one of the most complex foster care cases in Iceland by the professionals. As ableist as that sounds. Very quickly, I was facing very difficult challenges and situations, different professionals, multiple systems, and a society that has very little understanding of neurodiversity and the effects of complex trauma. As a disabled mother, in many ways, the professionals I communicated and cooperated with in many have been respectful, understanding and supportive. However, our unique situations and the barriers we are facing are difficult to explain and admit. I was and still am terrified that every struggle will be connected directly to me being disabled. I struggled, to, struggled with accepting help and asking for it, admitting when I was exhausted, when our connection and bonding was in low points, because for seven years I had needed to prove that I could be a mother. I know that any parent in our situation would be struggling, but I can't help to wonder if I'm being tested. There have been situations and days where I've thought to myself, did they place us together to prove a point, to set, up, set me up to fail, to be able to say, this disabled mother can't do it, we told her and everyone else, so. However, with the help of friends, my crib family and family, other disabled mothers, my personal assistants, and my therapist, I managed to navigate my overthinking head and be conscious of not letting my trauma and ableism control my every step. It's hard work and relentless, which my journey has shaped my everyday life and ableism in the, is in the air we breathe. But when I was in Galway a few years ago on the UNCRPT summer school, a presentation from a fellow disabled mama, Sarah Fitzgerald, girl, really stayed with me. I don't remember her exact, exact words, but she encouraged disabled parents to get support with dealing with anxieties around ableism towards disabled parenting. She reminded us that a mother's journey was to be too precious and important to let it be suffocated by ableism. Those words I carry with me every day. Just gonna have a sip of water. There's nothing in my life been more empowering as becoming a mom to my son. When you have lived your life labeled as a recipient of care, non trustworthy useless, a burden, an internal child, incapable of taking care of other human beings, becoming a mother is, well, excuse my language, kind of a big fuck you to the systemic ableism we've had to deal with our whole life. There's no doubt in my mind that my disability experience is my biggest resource as a mother. Knowing my way around the system, understanding the law environment, and being aware of what services are out there and which are not is helpful and something I have learned through being disabled myself, my educational background, and working as a disability rights protection agent in Iceland. 
Knowing the system doesn't change so complicated, it can be for me as a parent of a disabled child, but still helps me quicker know where to turn and what can or cannot be done. Also, also me and my son's experiences are different, and despite my many privileges of being white and raised in a stable and pretty traditional family in my country of origin, my experience of disability living in a body that does not fit normative standards and being faced with prejudice and dehumanization my whole life opens a pathway of understanding, empathy, validation, and connection for us. I don't know how many dark, sleepless nights I've sat with him, feeling powerless and overwhelmed by what he has injured, but still managing to use my experience to reach him and connect. I also think that knowing full well that you can never thoroughly understand anything you have not experienced helps when helps when he tells me you will never understand. It is true, I will not. It's hard, but I accept that. But the empowerment first and foremost lies in how my son sees me. No one accepts me as deeply as him. No one has shown me the unconditional trust as he does. No one has been so demanding and expecting of me, not cutting me any slack. It's beautiful and exhausting. And no one believes in me like he does. Although I'm usually the most annoying and tacky person he has ever known, I'm simultaneously the person he looks for for safety, reassurance and problem solving. He announced to a struggling friend last year, you should just talk to my mom. She solves everything. A lot of pressure. It's of course not his job to heal my wounds from oppression and discrimination, but our relationship and our family life has been both soothing and healing, hopefully for the both of us. It's hard to wrap up this journey. This is not just my story or my success. It is in many ways just a page in the history of disabled parents. I would not be here and neither with my son if it wasn't for the disability rights movement. Disabled parents fighting their way through the muddy road of disability oppression. I believe I would not have won this court case if it wasn't for the UN, CRPD and all the relentless work behind it and the independent living movement. And the laws and the laws that have changed around the globe. I also know I would not have gotten here if it wasn't for the social understanding of disability, which shaped my attorneys and somehow finally the courts. But there's always a but the laws and conventions are not enough. The discrimination I have entered, like so many other disabled parents, doesn't necessarily stop as you win the court case. The multi layers of ableism touch our lives every day, every day through laws, administration, professionals, systems, school, media, art, and so on. While we keep changing laws and winning court case, because we will, we may not lose sight of the importance of supporting disabled parents and our children in their grassroots work, activism, and the mundane revolutions that take place in their everyday life, in their homes and communities. The day I met my son for the first time, he sent his social worker away because he wanted to get shrimps and rice with me ASAP. I did not know that that was his safe food and food he uses to regulate his nervous system. Now I know. As we were nervously talking together, both shy, excited, terrified and curious, I told him about my family. At one point I said, I'm single and I have no kids. And then he looked at me straight in the face with his warm eyes and slight smile and said, but now you have me. And it's in these moments, no less than in a Supreme Court room, 
that we are transformed. The world changes and everything is reset that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you so much, Freya. That was incredible, as always. And it's so great that we've been able to have you back to hear the end of the story that you only started to tell us. Uh, I think it was in 2019 at the summer school. Mm -hmm. So I'm so yeah. glad that you have succeeded in your journey of becoming a parent and that you, despite all the tests that the system continues to throw at you, um, are clearly being an amazing parent and um, being an amazing parent to your son. So, uh, it's a hard act to follow, Susie, but I don't doubt that you can do it. I'm delighted now to introduce our respondent to, to Freya's keynote to put this in context and think about how Freya's experience is perhaps not so unique to Iceland, but could have more relevance here and elsewhere. Um, delighted to introduce Susie Byrne, a disability activist extraordinaire. So over to you, Susie. Thanks very much, Eleanor. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, Freya, thank you. I'm so glad that I came to summer school in 2019 and heard the story then and I'm back today to hear the conclusion or the start of the journey and um, whatever way you want to to, to uh, describe it. It's such um, an amazing um, end or beginning in terms of meeting your son um, and achieving all that you fought for. Um, as I'm sitting looking around the room and thinking having lots of uh, deja vu flashbacks over 20 plus years of talking about these issues and seeing other people talk. Um, I know that Grace Kelly, for example, is um, on the uh, going to speak today and Grace organized a conference that I spoke at in 2003. We are 20 years later and here I am sitting again talking about issues. And I remember at the time, um, the challenges for Grace in terms of putting together a conference to talk about sexuality. I was part of a group called Delicious, which was an LGBT disabled people's group. And I don't know why we called ourselves Delicious. It was just ridiculous. But we did. And um, we were starting out and we were being trying to find a room to meet. And there was all sorts of challenges going on. But at that time, I remember the discussion was about personal assistance and people's fear of coming out to their PAs and um, people who wanted to be able to hire PAs who were also lesbian or gay and being told by their service providers that they couldn't do that. People wanting to hire PAs that were of the same gender as they were and being told that they couldn't do that, which was not true. They would have been able to seek, um, you know, a, 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 an amendment themselves and be able to recruit somebody of a gender they were comfortable to work with, but the service providers were being difficult. That was only one of the issues at that time. I was also involved in discussions with women about accessing information about their bodies, about, you know, all through the 90s and the early 90s, those discussions, and they're not over yet, they're far from over in terms of people trying to exchange information amongst themselves for the barest of things, be it accessing contraception, be it thinking about childbirth, being afraid of having children removed from them, and all of these issues that are still today and are covered in the work of the project um, that we're here to talk about. And I was really, you know, I've been so glad to be involved in a very small way in an advisory capacity in this project because it now we have the research on so many of the issues that so many of us have known about talked about done peer support work on um and i suppose i wanted to talk today a little about the challenges that are ahead and some of the things that have happened that have left us in difficult situations and while we have spent a lot of time in Ireland in celebrating our social progress, disabled people's voices have very much been left on the side. When it came to issues like marriage equality, we didn't talk about the impact of marriage equality on disabled people. And the fact that the presumption of being in a relationship 
um, with somebody meant that people with disabilities could lose their means tested allowances, could lose aids and appliances, could lose all sorts of issues if they were seen to be in a relationship with somebody. Not even if they got married, but in the fact that they were cohabiting, the means test would apply. And so that was not allowed to be discussed during the marriage equality campaign. It was not um, seen by those that were proposing a yes vote as something that should be discussed. We were going to be the same as everybody else. That meant straight people were going to be discriminated against. Disabled gay people were also going to be discriminated against by the imputations of um, being in a relationship. And that actually exposes disabled people to abuse, potential abuse, financial abuse um, from partners. The fact that they don't have an independent means of their own. And there are also, of course, the cost of disability is not being taken into account in any of those discussions. When it came to repeal and the whole campaign for the repeal of the Eighth Amendment, they didn't know what to do about disability. I was in a room, I don't know if anybody else here at that time. Yeah, actually, yeah, there was other people in the room, actually. We were in a room where the, where the people who were getting ready for repeal wanted to talk to people about how they should use language around disability um, and about the campaign. And it was really interesting because there were some disabled people in the room, but we did feel that we were on, on show um, at that time, you know, and that there was a huge nervousness around issues to do with disability and repeal. And none of them really were about the rights of disabled people to access abortion. It was more to do with people with disabilities, children with disabilities, babies with disabilities, all of those issues. And nothing really about the fact that women with disabilities were going to have difficulties in accessing abortion. Issues around 12 weeks, limits, all of those things were going to harm and hurt disabled women more. And it was very clear that um, disabled people were being going to be in a corner away from things as much as possible. Now, there were lots of other groups that were put in a corner away from things as much as possible during repeal as well. And I know some of those campaigners are also in the room today. Um, but it was a very difficult place to be. Um, and I, and I, what I am very grateful for is that there are people that have emerged from that campaign that are leading the cause on disabled women's rights and disabled people's rights generally due to their experiences of repeal. And I can go off into my retirement now and uh, you know, know that, that things are in the safe hands of people like Disabled Women of Ireland um, and the many others that are involved in campaigns. But it just shows that um, even though there are many of us who are vocal and it's not easy to be vocal on these issues, and there are many people with experiences, uh, traumatic experiences of dealing with healthcare, the legal systems and the state around their sexuality, around reproductive rights. You know, there's a lot to be done in terms of equality proofing, um, in terms of ensuring that everybody who's affected by social change, by expanding human rights is re are really covered by the work that is undertaken. 2023, and I just move on to the Assist Decision Making Act, is our time, seemingly, hopefully, for the granting of rights for people with disabilities to make decisions. And why we await commencement date, and why we've had, what, nearly eight years of waiting for the commencement date. Uh, we've had lots of discussions and lots of training and we're waiting on codes of practice. Um, and I suppose one of the things that's now rearing its head is what are we going to do to detain disabled people, to deprive disabled people, to control disabled people in terms of deprivation of liberty? And those discussions are happening. They, they happened earlier on. They then went away because nobody know, knew what to do. There are now committees discussing what are go what's going to happen about depriving people of their liberty. And I think why this is important with regard to these discussions is that we have seen wardship used to control women's fertility, um, to control where they live and who and um, 
where they live and who they live with. And the Assisted Decision Making Act mightn't be able to be used for that, although I'm sure it will be. People will try and use it in terms of getting appointed as decision making representatives for people. But the guiding principles of the Act will get easily forgotten when people fear and panic around disabled people being wanting to live their lives, have relationships, um, be seen as sexual beings, be parents, access contraception, all of these things. And I don't think disabled people have really thought about those things or been had a, a forum to express those issues. And this might be something that comes from today's event to think about how we are going to tell the state that we do not want our liberty deprived in whatever they come up with legislatively to so-called protect disabled people. And when they then also maybe go on to put a safeguarding on a legislative footage, footage uh, basis. At the moment, safeguarding is very hit and miss. Um, it is policy. They spend more time saying what is not a safeguarding issue than what is a safeguarding issue. And actually, they also then don't look at the and don't want to hear about the extra resources or different ways of doing things that can support people to express their opinions, express their sexuality and keep safe. That's too much to think about. It's more about what we, can we do to stop people doing things and to make sure that we look after our own jobs rather than looking after the rights of people with disabilities to be who they want to be. And there are huge challenges that I think disabled people need to face. Um, we need support on. We can't enter into these dialogues on our own. We need supporters on it. And we also probably need to go back to the guiding principles of the um, the AGM, which are to presume capacity, to support people to make decisions, to support people to take risks, to support people to make the wrong decision, and to ensure that those people who are supporting people to make decisions are doing it not in the best interests of the person, but for the will and preference of the person that they are supporting. And I think all of those guiding principles are the things that could be lost as we get ready to commence the ADM. And I think that we need to be aware of that and speaking out about it, particularly as it comes to cover all of the things that we're going to be thinking about for the, you know, the, the rush to have decision-making agreements, the rush to the circuit court whenever there's enough judges for the decision-making representatives who's going to be checking and will the resources and the rights be there to support people who have all the official decision making things in place, but also will the resources and the intent and the political support be there to support decision making generally, because not everybody is going to need or want or should have an official decision making agreement. But the ADM is going to affect all our interactions with the state um, and all of the things that we want to do in terms of accessing health and social care, reproductive rights, you know, all our interactions with doctors, all of those things. And I don't know whether we've had enough discussion around sexuality and reproductive rights with regard to the ADM. And maybe that's happened a little bit in this project. I think it should happen, you know, further that you know, it's really important in the training um, and uh, the information that is given to everybody that the AGM and the guiding principles are there to support people around their rights to parent, around their rights to access contraception, around their rights to be seen as sexual beings. And, you know, the, that, along with all the other pieces of human rights law that we have, are, there are important things for us to progress. I don't know if I'd be around here in 20 years time. I don't know whether I want to be around 20 years time still discussing these issues. I hope that we'll have an awful lot more progress on it. I have spent the last 16 years in a professional capacity supporting people in decision making. And I've been in rooms where parents have had been told they're having their children removed from them. I've been in rooms where patients have been denied medical treatment that they've requested. 
denied access to contraception. I've been in discussions where people have been told that they can't live with their partner. Um, you know, and all of those things, and they're still happening to this day. Um, and they're happening in closed spaces, often, of course, for the most appropriate reasons in terms of in-camera discussions and protecting the rights of children. But unfortunately, the rights of disabled people in all of those arenas uh, get sidelined by the silence. And I think it's really important that we have enough blood and more noise and a lot of support and a lot of action on the issues. So I'm really looking forward to the discussions today um, and the further work of this project. There are some amazing speakers today who I've seen speak before, who are the experts in this area. Looking forward to hearing from them. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Susie. So we'll open the Q&A now. We're running a little bit um, over time, but not too bad. Uh, so we'll try and keep it short. <clears throat> Can you hear me? No, that's okay. Um, okay, so again, if there's people in the room who want to ask a question in person, please put up your hand and I'll call on you if you can give us your name and your um, organization. If you come from an organization, that would be great. Anyone online who wants to ask a question, please post it in the Q&A box on Zoom. Uh, so yeah, the floor is open for questions. Don't all rush at once. <laughs> Yeah, can you just tell us your name and wait for a mic to come to you first, sorry. Yeah, my, my name is Jerry Holden. I'm, I'm Regional Chief Officer for TUSA covering the West, uh, from Galway up to Mallinhead. Um, really enjoyed the, 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 the talks and the response, uh, really challenging to uh, the institutions and the systems and some of the processes that I represent as well, um, and definitely will take some learning. I suppose I'm interested in, um, from from Freya's point of view, when, when she actually did get um, social work involved with her and she was caring for her child and what her experience of the systems were in terms of the support that she got or didn't get and what advice she would give to me <laughs> in terms of managing social work services um, in this country. Yes. Great, thank you. We might just take one or two more questions and then we'll go back to our speakers before a break. Any any other question from the audience? No? Okay. Well, Freya, over to you then to answer Jerry's question. Yeah, thank oh, you, Jerry, for <laughs> thank you, Jerry, for your question. Um it's a very good question. I think that uh, one of my biggest fears. Uh, in becoming a foster parent was that I would need to be involved with the child protection services his or my child's entire time with me uh, because of the histories of uh, children being taken away from their parents. So I knew that this could either become a nightmare or if I was lucky uh, have a social worker that would understand our reality. Um, in my experience, the uh, like main social worker I have worked with since becoming a uh, foster mom has been great. Uh, she is my son's caseworker. Um, she has been very committed to uh, trying to meet our the family's needs and um, and just being understanding of the, the unique situations that we are going through. Um, of course, that doesn't change that I am still often afraid about how things will be interpreted or, or how they will respond, especially um, the last few months, we needed quite a lot of uh, more services for my son. Um, but in general, I have had good experience with her. And in most ways, other professionals. But what I, um, which I was not able to talk about today, just to, due to the time frame, but um, what I've experienced in the social work like aspect is that 
it's not only about the, for example, caseworker, because uh, the caseworker is very important and is in communication with the family and child, but there's also their supervisors and their um, bosses, basically, because we've experienced now a change. Uh, so she used to have a supervisor who was very understanding of her situation, was very willing to um, create a space where we could flourish as a family. And now there has been change, and unfortunately, this understanding is not um, not happening. And I can really feel how powerless the social worker, his caseworker, is in these situations. So I think it really kind of reminds us that both like how individuals shape the system and how one person can all of a sudden change the whole situation, but also how important it is to, to kind of push for knowledge and education and, and just the like overall the like the awareness of ableism and other discriminatory factors for everyone in the system, not just the ones that are on the ground working, not just the supervisors, but all of them. And also that that when we get new people, that we are not faced with the threat of everything changing because they because they're ableist. So I don't know if it makes sense, but I hope that um, this answers some of your questions. Thanks, Sir Derry. Sir Derry. So, uh, since we're running a little bit behind, uh, if you still have questions, uh, keep them in mind for later. And I just want to thank Freya and Susie so much for opening our event with such a really important discussion about all the elements that we need to address in our systems related to reproductive decision making. Uh, so we'll go for coffee now and we'll try to be back by half past 10. And thank you again to Susie and Freya for an amazing start to today. Thank you so much.